Hello and welcome to the third video in my series on the Century aircraft and this behind me is a Convair F-102 Delta Dagger. This was the first USAF interceptor that flew supersonic and also had a Delta wing. I'm Paul Stewart and I make videos about planes and a few rockets. If you're into reviews of flights from around the world and detailed tours through interesting aircraft and museums then please check out my channel and subscribe. The aircraft was developed in response to the 1954 Ultimate Interceptor Program from the USAF with the idea being that a rapid fighter was required to respond to incoming Soviet bombers and destroy them before they got to US mainland. The YF-102 prototype first flew in 1953. It had an extremely long and sleek fuselage with side mounted air intakes and was constantly upgraded during its life culminating in the B model, which was such a change that they redesignated it the F-106, which gets its own video later in this series. Right at the front is the nose boom and pitot tube, and behind that is the nose cone. Inside that was the Hughes MC-3 fire control system, which was subsequently upgraded to the MG-10. This was able to identify enemy targets, steer the aircraft via the autopilot and fire the weapons or with the pilot's oversight. Moving back, we have the side mounted air inlets which, by the way, were moved back much further with the upgraded F-106. Originally they were thought that longer ducks would reduce surging, but later testing identified that it wasn't the case. Of interest, this is why the Tupolev Tu-144 had much longer ducks than the Concorde, because the Soviets only had access to much older engineering data. By the way, that was a fascinating aircraft and I've toured around that in another video on my channel. There's also this splitter plate to remove the boundary layer of air. Now let's talk about the armament. This was the first US fighter designed without a gun. A pod with a Gatling gun, similar to what they did with the F-4 Phantom II which also originally didn't have a gun, was discussed but didn't eventuate. The missiles were all stored internally in three bomb bays as to maintain the slippery profile and speed. Inside the missile bay doors were 24 folding fin unguided rockets. Centrally located is an AIM-26 Falcon which could have a conventional or nuclear warhead. As I mentioned in the F-101 video, the idea was that a nuclear air-to-air -air missile would be used to fire into a large pack of Soviet bombers and the single explosion would destroy many of them. Of interest, this was the only nuclear weapon in the US military arsenal that could be fired by a single person without command authority. It could also be fitted with regular AIM-4 Falcon air-to-air -air missiles. Now let's mention this wing, which as I said before was the first fighter with the Delta wing. This triangle shape, best appreciated from above, offers ideal high altitude and speed performance and went on to be used by many aircraft afterwards. It has these two wing fences here to force the air to move straight over it rather than moving sideways which could cause the wing to stall. And getting out to the wingtip, you'll notice this conical droop which improves low speed performance, which is often a problem with Delta jets, hence why so many aircraft such as the Concorde and B-58 had very high landing and takeoff speeds, and it also helped with side wind stability. As you can see, even with this knight's armour in the way, this doesn't have a horizontal stabiliser, and instead the roll was controlled by ailerons, which combines the role of both the elevator and the ailerons on the wing's trailing edge. The large wing has the added advantage of being able to store a lot of fuel, thus improving range. A disadvantage would be the increased weight from the size of it. I should mention that early testing identified poorer performance than expected. In fact, it struggled to reach supersonic speed, which mathematical calculations suggested it should have done with ease. They discovered that there was considerable transonic drag, and this was resolved by lengthening the fuselage and narrowing the middle section over the wings, thus giving it the coke bottle shape. This was due to the realisation of the area rule, which I won't try and explain, but there's some other good videos that do. Here is a photo of the original prototype before the changes were made with the narrowing of the fuselage, and next to that is the updated model. With these changes, it easily reached the top speed of Mach 1.25. It was fitted with two auxiliary fuel tanks to increase the range, although they would reduce the top speed. And under here is a regular tricycle layout with the main landing gear with fairly standard small wheels. A slight but interesting tangent is the British approach to wheels during the Cold War. The TSR2, for example, was designed to have especially large wheels. Because they are much closer to the USSR, it's possible that the airfield may have already been damaged before they can respond, as they have far less warning time. 
Therefore, they needed to be able to take off from a damaged runway or even a grassy field. Now I know that the TSR wasn't an interceptor, but it was interesting nonetheless with its massive wheels. You have this red hook here, which was not for aircraft carriers, but could be lowered during an emergency landing to rapidly slow you rather than having an excursion into the field or worse. Let's mention this hairdryer, which was a trusty Pratt & Whitney J57 turbojet producing 11,700 pounds or 17,000 pounds with the afterburner activated. These aft fairings here on both sides of the exhaust were added as a part of the changes to address the transonic drag that I mentioned earlier. This more tapered end of the fuselage addressed the Mach tuck, which was an aerodynamic effect where the nose is pitched downwards when the airflow around the wings reaches the supersonic speed. You'll notice that the first prototype didn't have these fairings. Above the engine are deployed air brakes, and above that is the vertical fin with a danger sign on the air brakes to remind the maintenance engineers that they could get a whack across the head if they were activated on the ground. We'll sneak underneath those elevons I mentioned earlier and wander out to the wingtip and have a look again. The F-102 did not have in-air refueling probes itself, although one was temporarily installed so that it could fly across the Pacific with a tanker along for the ride. These reduced their performance by around 10% and were removed as soon as they arrived in their destination in Southeast Asia. Again, there's no horizontal stabilizer as you can see the wing extends right to the aft end of the plane. Moving forward along the wing's leading edge, which I should mention did not have any lift devices, we reach the internal weapons bay once again and you can see that the missiles are now in their storage setting while they extend it out on the other side and ready for deployment. I always enjoy when museums open up the various hatches and bays on their exhibits so that we can see inside. This was flown by a single pilot and as I said earlier, much of the locating and weapons activation was automated, thus leaving the pilot for other duties. There was a two-seat training version developed and this was used to help train pilots for the B-58 Hustler as it shared the Delta wing design. There was poor rearward visibility, although this was less of an issue in the interceptor role where it would be targeting bombers rather than highly maneuverable fighters. As well as the interceptor role during the Cold War, it escorted B-52s during the Vietnam War where it experienced its only air-to-air -air loss from a MiG-21. The F-102 was designed to operate with the Sage, an incomplete system at the time of development of this aircraft where it would be directed towards the intruder and weapons fired remotely from the ground using their far more powerful radars. During the development, all they knew was that it required a digital fire control system and autopilot. Once SAGE was operational, F-102s were modified to then work with it. The F-102 was transferred to the National Guard in the late 1960s and was sold to both the Greek and Turkish Air Forces. George W. Bush, who later became the President of the United States, flew the F-102 during his time serving in Texas. In 1976, the F-102 was retired from service, although converted target drone versions were flown up until 1986. I hope you've enjoyed this latest episode looking at the Century Jets, and please check out my other videos if you haven't already, and many others filmed at the National Museum of the USAF here in Dayton. If you enjoyed it, then please give the video a thumbs up as it really helps the channel grow. Thanks for watching.